Our scripture reading is in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Galatians 1, 13 through 17. The Apostle Paul's the writer, and he said, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who are apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we commit this message time to you. We thank you for the inerrant, inspired word of God that's our final uh, foundation for faith and truth and reality in this life. And Lord, we, we, these are not mere words of man, but from you. And Lord, as we extrapolate them, as we look into them today, I pray you help us to understand because of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to apply these things to our lives, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We're going to talk about how we can preach the gospel in the name of Jesus, and that's what Paul did, and it begins with us in our hearts being ready to share that gospel with other people. Our purpose today in this message is that every Christ follower must be ready always to share how our life was before Christ, how we came to Christ, and in our life after Christ, the transformation that occurred with those who want to know the hope that lives within us. When it comes to our salvation experience, we're called by God to be bold and unashamed of the gospel that transforms our lives. <clears throat> I think back in spring of 1973, I had just become a Christian in October of 1972. My next door neighbor, Skip Pascarelli, my friends, Bob Humphrey, Tom Jacobs, and all our friends, we would get together and play baseball, we'd play hockey, we'd do all these things. But in the spring, we went to a new church, and that pastor gave us a little booklet called The Romans Road. And so I got all my buddies together in the spring in the garage, and through a poor stumbling process began to have a Bible study with my close friends at the time because I couldn't contain myself of what happened in my life. See, we live in a deeply post-Christian culture and we are the 15th most post-Christian community in the United States, Davenport, Bettendorf, Rock Island, and Moline. People in our world are open more than ever to spiritual conversations. When Don and Jody Green were here on September 16th for our Saturday Evangelism Seminar, they shared these statistics. 73% of unchurched Americans ages 20 through 29 want to know more about God. 89% say they would be willing to have a conversation about Christian beliefs. 63% say they would listen to a message from the church if it related to their life. 58% said if they were cared for, <clears throat> they would attend church. And something in research that just came out last week, Barna said this, the number one thing people who are spiritually open but are not attached, that are seeking, is someone to listen to them without judgment. The next two qualities they're looking for in Christians are people who are honest about their doubts and don't force them into conclusions. Kind of sounds like what most of us want in a friend in a conversation anyway, isn't it? So why aren't we sharing our faith? Well, Don and Jody Green at that seminar shared a few things from Crew Campus Crusade for Life. They've done surveys, lack of desire. We don't have a burden for the lost. Fear, fearful we might mess up in sharing our faith. Lack of know-how. <clears throat> we need to be trained and learn more. Few friendships with non-believers, that's a problem. We need to find ways to get out of our areas that we're in with believers and engage with others as well. That's one of the things I do at teach at Scott Community College. Austin works over at Milltown as a barista. We find ways to connect 
with non-believers. So busyness, our busy schedules. We have the source for life change, but like a power cord that does not send power to a lamp until it's plugged in, we have to be the source of that power to share with those around us. So let's look at Paul's biography this morning, which covers his life before Christ, how he came to Christ in the book of Galatians here, and his life after receiving Christ. So if you have your outlines out, the first blank is delight. The delight of sharing your testimony is evidence of your salvation. The delight of sharing your testimony is evidence that you're saved, that you can't help but share what God has done in your life. Paul's former life before knowing Christ. Look at verses 13 and 14. We just read those a moment ago. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. Paul's pre-conversion life was totally centered on keeping the law and being zealous to maintain the truth, even to persecuting those who were in his mind false teachers. He had no understanding of grace, even though grace was seen throughout the Old Testament. The Jews had long lost sight of grace and the Pharisees were all about the law, adding to the law and following tradition. It was a behavior-based, not a heart-based religion. This made Paul diametrically opposed to the gospel of grace out of ignorance. Look at Philippians 3 on the screen, and we see his pedigree. We see his credentials. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone also else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Listen, I can top everybody with all my pedigree, he's saying. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I want to stop there and we'll come back to Philippians. But I want to pause and say he was taught by one of the greatest rabbis of the day, Gamaliel. And so Gamaliel, as it says in Acts 22.3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you this day. So some say, scholars say, that Paul may have equivalent of two PhDs in his rabbinic teachings. He knew the scriptures in and out. He knew the Old Testament. Back to Philippians 3. As to the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, From his perspective before Christ, he was blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Now, in the original language, it's dung, menorah, and we can't describe it any more than that. That's how he views it in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. The law, as we'll see later on in Galatians, is a schoolmaster, a tutor. It can't save us, but it brings us to the fact that we can't keep the law and we need a savior. In James, it says, if we've broken the law at one point, we're guilty of breaking all of it. So the law is a tutor to say, hey, you need to go to Christ. This is, this is better. This is what you need. And that's the purpose of the law, to show us we can't measure up. Where does the righteousness come from? In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God that when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sin, to come into our heart and our life, that his righteousness of Christ is imputed, is placed within us, and he takes away our sin to give us forgiveness. And so the righteousness we receive is through grace, through faith in Christ. So if Paul counted on his Jewish education, his zeal, and 
blameless attitude toward the law, why did he count it as dung and as a loss? Because he know, knew that it wasn't enough to attain the righteousness of God. Back to 13 of Galatians 1, Paul wanted to destroy the church. The word destroy means soldiers at war ravaging a city. It is in the imperfect tense, which means that Paul is going to continue to do it over and over and over again. He held the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. He went house to house looking for Christians to imprison in Acts 8. Perhaps a year later, he went to the high priest at the time and received letters of permission to travel to Damascus and along the way imprison those who were following the way of the Nazarene, as they were called at the time in Acts 9. Paul's goal was to crush the small infant Christian church before it grew even more. And after Paul was saved because of the past persecution of the Christians that he performed, he felt a great sense of unworthiness when considering his apostleship. It kept him humble and able to handle the persecution that God called him to in his life with joy. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. To repeat, Paul was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees had no room for a gospel of grace, and they sought out those who believed it and taught it to exterminate them. In verse 14, Paul is saying he was above everyone else in his zeal for Jewish traditions and the law before his salvation. Notice he says, I was advancing in Judaism. That means to chop ahead as if blazing a trail through the forest. Paul was blazing a trail for Judaism, which meant cutting anything down in the path, like the Jewish Christians who would subvert Judaism. And these people were traitors and now arch enemies of the Jews. He pursued them to synagogues and foreign cities in Acts chapter 26. You see the word many. Paul exceeded all the others with his passion for his religion and his intolerance for the truth about Jesus Christ in Philippians 3, as we read. See, ancestral traditions, that's the body of oral teachings about the Old Testament law that came to have equal authority to the law found in scriptures. The Halakha was a collection of Torah interpretations and it built a fence around God's revealed law and all but hid the scripture law from view. They got so wrapped up in the interpretations of the rabbis that they didn't look to the scripture directly to find the truth. And more and more traditions and interpretations were added until for the Pharisees it became a very complex and burdensome religion. So now the Jewish legalists who were zealous revered it and propagated it as these Jewish legalist Christians. We see Paul's step of faith in coming to Christ. That was his pre-conversion experience. Now he tells us about what happened when he came to Christ. In verse 15, he says, But when he who had set me apart, God, before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. It's interesting to think about the length that God will go to save someone. Think about it. Only the resurrected Christ himself could have reached the heart of Paul, the Pharisee, the premier Jew of the Jews. After salvation, nothing but his transforming power of the gospel could cause Paul to identify with those he was attempting to destroy. God called Paul to salvation and service as he does every believer. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In 1 Peter 2.9, he says that you and I, we are called to be royal priests, to serve him. So Paul was called before he was born to bring the gospel to the Jews, but primarily to the Gentiles. And like Jeremiah and Isaiah, if you read their stories, they were called in their mother's womb. Like John the Baptist, Paul was not ranking his calling, but is saying that just like these men, his calling was from God as well. God called him through his grace, by his unmerited love and kindness, as God does for everyone who comes to faith in Christ. I was reading a story in, on an Assembly of God website about how 
<clears throat> Muslims are, and you've heard this about Muslims, having dreams. And in those dreams, they're about Christ and different things. And then they go and find a Christian to interpret and lead them to Christ. Recently, one of the leaders shared a testimony. A woman had left the Muslim faith, but she was full of hatred and suspicion of Christians. She didn't know what to do. She asked God for help. One night, she had a dream where she saw a shepherd walking about an empty tomb with a staff, and he walked around that empty tomb three times. And then he headed toward the woman, and he had a loaf of bread in his hands, which he broke and offered to her, and he, and he took it, and he gave it to her, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. She woke up. She was traumatized by that dream. She found someone who was a Christian. She got the interpretation, understanding that was Jesus coming to her, and she became a believer in Christ. God works in amazing ways, like he did in the life of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, like in the life of this woman. God will do whatever he needs to bring someone to himself. We see in verse 16, the content of Paul's preaching is Jesus Christ. The Judaizers, these are the legalistic Jewish believers, needed to hear and know that the Gentile believers did not need to be versed in the law of Moses or the traditions of the Jewish elders, but to believe simply in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 17, we see that God chose to reveal his son to and through Paul. Isn't that amazing? It says that God chose to reveal his son to me. And not only that, but to reveal the son in me so others could see the gospel at work in my life. Paul had to see Jesus first in 1 Corinthians 9. Then God could reveal his son through Paul in all his preaching and his miracles, his journeys and persecutions. In verse 16, the second part of that verse and onward, Paul did not, he's making a statement here, he did not get trained by any of the apostles, but at first by Jesus Christ himself. We see Paul sharing his powerful testimony before King Agrippa. In Acts 26, look to the screen and we're going to see Paul describing his conversion experience. In verse 12, he begins in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. And that was to put these so-called followers of the way, the Christians in jail. In verse 13, at midday, O king, he said, I saw a, the way, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you've seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And I love what he said here. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He knew when he was transformed what he was called to and he immediately went about the business of learning how to share the gospel and leading people to Christ. So whatever your personal testimony is, God has given you an amazing story. Don't denigrate. Your, maybe you got saved when you were four years old. Maybe you grew up in Sunday school. Maybe you were a drug addict. All these things. doesn't matter. Your story is amazing. And God has given it to you. And we all come to Christ the same way Paul did, but with different circumstances. So never underestimate the power of your testimony mixed with the power of scriptures that God can use to bring someone into his kingdom. Be bold like Paul to share it. Here's the way you can apply this point to your life. Everyone has an amazing story of how they came to faith in Christ. Never underestimate. God will bring people into your path that have a similar background with similar circumstances and you'll be amazed how God can use your testimony to share the gospel with them. Well, Paul not only received the gospel of Christ, but he was faithful to God's calling to share it with others. 
The next blank there is the desire, the desire to share the gospel, the desire to share the gospel. I think it's interesting, of all the apostles, they were all discipled by Christ, and so was Paul. Paul was discipled by Christ. In Galatians 1, second part of verse 17, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus, and then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, or Peter, the apostle Peter, and I stayed with them for 15 days. But I, didn't, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In verse 20, he says, And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Now remember, on the road to Damascus, after the light came and, and Saul, then, who became Paul, was blinded. And he met up with Ananias. And Ananias prayed over him and the scales were re- removed from his eyes. But the Ananias and the disciples They met with Paul briefly after his salvation and he preached for just a short amount of time in the synagogues before going to Arabia to study with Jesus. He had no apostolic consultation. And so when he went to Arabia, this was Nabataean Arabia, a region that stretched east from Damascus to the Sinai Peninsula. And Paul stayed very close to Damascus during this period of time. And at this time, he was pretty much by himself He studied the Old Testament, which he knew backwards and forward, but now it was in light of Jesus' teachings and how it all fit together. And he also spent time with Jesus, and Jesus helped train him and teach him as well. After that, he went back to Damascus to preach for another short amount of time. And all, Paul was probably in that region of Damascus for about three different years. The product of these days in Arabia was that the Christian theology that Paul explained became the epistle of the book of Romans. So he went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter more. He saw James, the brother of Jesus, and the pastor of the Jerusalem church. James was an apostle in the broadest sense of the word because he was pastor of that local church in Jerusalem. And Paul and the 12 apostles were commissioned to be witnesses, to the, as they were witnesses to the resurrection and had unique power and authority because they all had that ex- similar experience. So Paul stayed with Peter for 15 days and Paul's purpose for going to Jerusalem was only to get to know those apostles, these apostles who shared life with Jesus. In verse 20 of this chapter, Paul needed to say that he was not lying because earlier in the chapter, he was accused of making up the gospel and fabricating it. In the early part of chapter one, if you remember, uh, he did all that trying to, again, show his apostleship and prove that he had not made it, and he repeats it again here. In summary of these verses, the Judaizers need to know that it was not some heresy attributed to a few Jewish converts. So Paul lays out that his training came from Christ and his study of the Old Testament were considered in light of Christ's teaching. Then we see Paul declared the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He declared the gospel, verse 21, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Paul left to go to Syria and Cilicia, which is modern southeast Turkey and Lebanon, and it provided more proof of Paul's independent knowledge of the true gospel. This was near his hometown of Tarsus. And although Paul met persecution and opposition as he preached Christ in the gospel, he stayed in that area for several years. And while they heard reports about Paul, he remained personally unknown to them. They heard he was preaching the faith that he once persecuted the people of. Preaching the faith means here the content of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it took a good while before Christians were convinced that Paul was the real deal. Barnabas vouched for him with the disciples and then the leaders of the early church. And finally, they could not dispute his fruit in ministry and the persecution Paul was facing for his faith in Christ. They couldn't refute Paul's authority as an apostle. He preached the same gospel as the apostles did. He was recognized by Peter, James, and the other apostles as one sent 
to reach the Gentiles. In Galatians 2.9, they gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship to recognize them as godly leaders. And even in 2 Peter, toward the end of his book, Peter asserts that Paul is the writer of certain scriptures that are hard to understand because he was an apostle writing the inspired word of God. Because of all this, they glorified God for his kingdom work. He wasn't someone who the Pharisees were sending to be an undercover agent to subvert the followers of the way's faith. After all, he was the real deal. And nothing greater could be said of anyone as is written in Galatians 1.24, and they glorified God because of me. Can you pause this morning and imagine the exhilaration in the heart of Paul that he was finally accepted as an apostle, that he was believed that he preached the gospel with pure motives, that he was seeing powerful fruit with people coming to faith in Christ, being discipled, matured. He was planting churches with elders trained and then he would travel on to other places all because he saw the undeniable light of Christ on the road to Damascus. Let it be said of each of us that we be found faithful to our mentors, to the one who led us to Christ, to glorify God because of what God has done in us and through us. May we find joy in those we led to Christ or we invested in their growing in Christ and we see the fruit of Christ in their lives. There isn't a greater joy on this earth than to see our spiritual children walking faithfully with God. The Apostle John said this in 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. My life verses, two of them, Philippians 1, 19 through 20, I eagerly expect and hope that in no way will I be ashamed, but with sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether it be by life or by death, and for me to live is to Christ and to die is gain. I hope that you desire to God, that God would say people are glorified because of who you are. As we close today, Charles Plum was a U.S. Navy jet pilot in Vietnam, and after 75 combat missions, he was shot down by a surface-to-air missile. He ejected and parachuted right into the enemy hands, and he was there captured for six years. And he went through all kinds of ordeal and torture, and after he got it, he began to go on tour and share about that experience. Well, one day, Plum and his wife were sitting in a restaurant, and a man at another table came up and said, you're Plum, you flew those jet fighters into Vietnam. You were shot down. Plum asked, how in the world did you know that? He says, I packed your parachute. Plum gasped in surprise and gratitude. The man pumped his hand and said, I guess it worked. And Plum assured him, it sure did. If your chute hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here to talk to you. But Plum could not sleep that night. Thinking about that man, Plum says, I kept wondering what he might have looked like in a Navy uniform, a white hat, a bib in the back, and bell-bottom trousers. I wonder how many times I might have seen him and not even said, good morning, how are you? Or anything, because you see, I was a fighter pilot and he was a mere sailor. Plum thought of the many hours the sailor had spent on a long wooden table in the bows of the ship, carefully weaving the shrouds and folding the silks of each chute, holding in his hands each time the fate of someone he didn't know. Now Plum asks his audience, who's packing your parachute? Who's done something that's helped make your day safer or easier or more pleasant? Or who have you witnessed packing for someone else? Recognize them right away. Who told you about Christ? Who discipled you? We're all grateful to someone for introducing us to Jesus. Let's give thanks for those that packed the parachute to share the gospel with us. Here's our final application. If God has radically changed your life, how can you not share it with others? If God has radically changed your life, how can you not share it with others? Here's our key thought, the overarching thing to take away from this message. How are you fulfilling the scripture that says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so? In Psalm 107.2, we're commanded as the redeemed to share what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. Your question is to ponder this week, can you share your salvation testimony?
Have you ever shared your salvation testimony? Who could you share your salvation testimony with this week? Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. Lord, I just, it's hard for me to put myself in his shoes as radical as as a fanatic he was to try to maintain the truth before he was saved out of ignorance. But then to see the light switch flip and all of a sudden he was as strong and fanatical and bold for Christ after he received the gospel. Lord, help us to take lessons from the Apostle Paul. Help us as we said in those statistics at the beginning of the message, know that there's people out there who are open. If we will take the time to listen, to be not judgmental, and to have continuing conversations, spiritual conversations, to share the good news of Christ with others. Give us that opportunity this week to do that with someone. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.